Hey guys, it's me. I'm back. Feel free to skip this video um, because there's almost no musical content to it. Um, I decided to come in and bitch and moan about my personal life a little bit. Um, and partially because of some strange coincidences that have happened and, and um, I'm not really a superstitious person. But just in the last year, especially since joining the VC, uh, with VC members, I've had some strange coincidences, especially with CARM, about music. Um, you know, I might be listening to a CD and, and, and um, I would see CARM would, for instance, put up a video. And in one case, I was listening to an Andy Summer CD that I hadn't played for years. Um, my favorite CD by him called Mysterious Barricades. And I got a little notification that... Um, Carm had put up a video and what's playing in the video, but this is the very first track from the same CD that I had just started playing a half hour or so before that, after not listening to it for a bunch of years. And oddly enough, Carm didn't even know what the, what the tune was, what the track was. He had it off of an old radio broadcast. Um, things like that happened in the last year since I joined the VC. Now, there's things out that are happening outside um, in, in my outside life that are quite unusual too. And I had one happen today, which is probably why I'm, I'm here blabbing about this. Um, and uh, everybody who watches my videos know about my job situation. I, I, I lost my job after 28 years last April. Um, and kind of uh, didn't do anything until really January. I was taking my first break from having a job in something like 33 years because um, I hadn't had more than a week off uh, in all that time between jobs or anything. Um, and um, I started a job which I you know, have been moaning about here uh, back in January. And this is a very built up, developed area here. So some weird coincidences have happened and I don't know if I spoke about this, but um, Monday through Saturday, uh, when and if I work, um, all of my work initially, I go into the office, I quote, the office is basically a big warehouse that all the people who do my job were dispatched out from there and we go out on the road and do our job and at the end of the day come back to this warehouse and you know do our thing and then go home um now this warehouse and area is right in the town where i live in which is convenient because at least uh work is close by it doesn't take me more than five minutes to get to work um which is trust me no reason to keep the job but um on Sundays when I work, and I work, it's weird, you know, uh, say two out of every three Sundays generally, it seems like. Um, and I really don't have much of a weekend because I never get a Monday off. I never get a Saturday off. I really never get a Friday off either. Um, and, you know, I get maybe one in every three Sundays off. But the odd thing is that whenever I work on Sundays, that's the only day of the week that the office slash warehouse that we um, that everybody reports to and then goes out to work from there isn't the one in my town, isn't my normal one that I go to on Monday through Friday. Um, most of those are closed. Um, and they tend to gather a whole bunch of people that do my job from different towns and they send them to this one particular you know, warehouse slash office that all the people that have to work on Sunday get dispatched out of and then go out on the road. I don't think I mentioned this, but I may have. In complete coincidence, the office slash warehouse that whenever I work on a Sunday that I have to work out of is within a matter of feet, easily walking distance of my old office that I worked at for over 25 years. Um, it's physically the closest structure, building, business, anything next to the old office building that I worked at. 
Um, and that can't be coincidence. You know, as a matter of fact, when I'm out there and I'm, there's, there's a loading dock on the back of this warehouse, kind of. And, uh, you know, everybody pulls their trucks up to there um, or their large vans, whatever you want to call them. Um, when you're on this loading dock preparing for your day's work on a Sunday, if you look up at all, what's in front of you but the building that I used to work at. Um, and that is a big coincidence, especially in this area, because uh, maybe in some parts of the country that are more rural, you have uh, big areas where there's a lot of people that live in and not a lot of businesses, and the business is all concentrated maybe in one area. Um, so maybe that wouldn't be as much of a coincidence if that were the case. Um, simply because all the businesses are glopped into one area in parts of the country, but not here. Everything's all big and developed, and um, it, it's, it was just a funky, weird coincidence, especially the first two or three times that I had to go there. And I'm trying not to look at the building, but if I look up, I'll, I'm, you know, while I'm preparing, because you're there for about uh, maybe an hour, maybe a little bit longer, uh, preparing to go out on the road for the day. And then at the end of the day, you drive back there. And it's literally the way that I drove to work for 25 years. Um, I worked out of that building for 25 years, even though I worked for the company for 28. Um, and or actually, I, I worked at that building for over 25 years. And, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things that freaked me out that made me think this can't be a coincidence. There's all these businesses, um, you know, in between the 12 miles or so from where I live and the main office that I normally work out of. And this old job that I had, which just happens to have a warehouse slash office right next to it. Um, that does the same thing that my office does, but it's a different town. It's a different group of managers, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, and yet something here I am on a Sunday and I'm looking at my old building and just thinking that's, too, that's just too, it's too weird. It's too coincidental. And I've, you, you know, <laughs> I've had things like that happen. Um, now when I lost my job, a whole bunch of people lost their job. And, you know, there's, uh, you know, after having worked for the company for as many years as I did, there's very, very few, literally, you know, a few people that were still with the company uh, that were there when I started. Um, and as a matter of fact, there's a few people that were that were there when I started, left the company a number of years later, five years later, 10 years, 15 years later, went to go work for other jobs. And a few of them actually came back to the company. This is during a time that the company wasn't downsizing. Um, and they came back a second time to go work for my old company. And some of them even stayed for a few years and left after that. This is how long I was there. Um, but there was uh, one, one person in particular, a girl who's a little bit younger than me, who was there when I started at the company. And it was very small then, you know, before before they expanded um, and were bought out by larger corporations and, and got real big. Um, there was only about 30 some odd, 40 people maybe in this little office. And the company got bought out by a bigger conglomerate, whatever. And they actually added staff um, in my area. So the offices went got huge at one point. And this girl was there and... Uh, her future husband was there. I actually worked with her husband in this old office job. And the two of them had been on and off dating and they had met at that job. Um, so her husband was there for a number of years. So I know him and this, this, this girl was there and, and uh, her husband left after a few years, but I always kind of knew what was going on with him because this girl stayed there. Um, and she stayed for uh, another 15 or more years and um, she got another job and left the company. I was, you know, this isn't somebody I was particularly close to or had anything in common with, but because we had started together when we did, when the company was like 30 some odd people and most of those people had left in the intervening years and 
you continue to work together for another 15, 17 years, whatever it was, um, it's almost like a family. Even though you have nothing in common with these people, these five or six people that may have stayed with the company after all those years that were there and that you know original core of 20 or so people, I say it almost becomes like family, but there's almost this thing like you've got more of a connection with them than you do with um, uh, – you know, a lot of maybe people that have come along since and, you know, people jump ship and they come and they go. Um, and this isn't somebody that I, you know, I, would, I wouldn't say I, I dislike her, um, but it's not somebody that I really had anything in common with. Um, but we were, you know, friendly because it was like, wow, we were together back in 1988 when, you know, this company was 30 people. And out of those 30 people, there's four or five that are, you know, still with the company. Like I said, she had left and she was gone for maybe five years or so and ended up getting another job and coming back to the company back around 2000 something. Uh, I don't know, 2005, 2000, 2006 or seven, something like that. She came back to the company, and um, oddly enough, this is another coincidence, ended up working um, in a kind of like companion department to mine. At the point that she came back, the company was so big, there were hundreds of people there. So if she, was just, if she had just been rehired back by the company, um, she might have shot me an email and say, hey, guess what, Gary, I'm working back for the company again. Hi, how you doing? And I would have potentially never seen her. Um, because of the size of the company at the time that she came back. In an odd coincidence, though, um, when she came back, the position she had, which was completely different than what I did, um, had the same upper manager, say. Um, we all had supervisors, and the supervisor's manager turned out to be the same guy. So um, we were working together on the same floor, um, maybe once a month or so when, when there would be departmental meetings, um, it was from the manager and all the people that reported below him, so she would be there. So it was weird that she ended up right back into this, do, doing a completely different job than me, but the structure was so that they decided to lump us in with this other group, this other group shared a manager. So here we are on the same floor, oddly enough, after all those years, at this point the company had hundreds of people. And yet here we are, you know, a matter of, you know, 30 feet in a, you know, in a cubicle apart from each other. Um, she's one of those people that it's, you know, and here's another coincidence, okay? You know, obviously I'm thinking in my present work situation, which is just horrible and getting, I didn't think it could get worse, but it's getting worse. I got in trouble on last Saturday a week ago. I got in trouble on Monday. I got written up for job performance on uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, Wednesday, I think it was, and yelled at and screamed at by this boss that I've talked about in the past. Um, it seems like I can do no right, you know, and, and basically, obviously, I need money. But I'll tell you, my main reason for sticking with the job right now is the health care benefits. I got a couple things going on, nothing serious, but, you know, I got to go to the doctor. I got to go dentist and all this stuff. And, I, you know, I want to get these things done and kind of taken care of um, while I'm covered with health care. If, you know, we had a system like Canada, Europe or something like that, I would have quit this job already, you know, and, and, and figured, you know, lived off my, my tax return, which I could do for maybe a couple months if I'm really careful. I got my income tax return. And, you know, if I don't spend any money on anything, I could pay my basic bills for a couple months I could squeeze by. Um, but the health care is an issue. You know, I've had health care. I was employed solidly for 33 years or something like that. And um, I had a couple things. I had wisdom teeth taken out, had kidney stones. So, you know, things that I needed treatment for. But... Um, it was weird that I didn't get really sick until I wasn't covered with health care. This past Christmas, before I started working at the new job, and this was 
you know, after last April when I lost my job. I have music playing in the background, by the way. And it goes from being too loud to too soft. Um, before I lost my job in, in April, I hadn't really been really sick, you know. And um, at this past Christmas time, I got what I thought was the flu, but I got so sick and then I, I, with such a bad cough. And uh, I got back pains and then I started getting weak that on uh, Christmas Eve, I found myself almost checking into a hospital uh, without health care, which would have been pretty devastating. And um, I ended up going to urgent care. First time I'd ever been to an urgent care here. Uh, well, anywhere. Um, those clinics have really, in this country, just opened up in the last few years, and I highly recommend them. It's generally about $75 to walk in and to, to pay the basic office fee. Um, at least it isn't. That's what it costs in this area. You see a doctor, but, you know, they can't do anything too elaborate like x-rays. But I talked to the doctor, um, you know, told her what was going on with me, and she told me she thought I had walking pneumonia, which is incredible because I had never been sick like that in, certainly not in my adult life. And, of course, it happens just as I have no health care coverage. Um, luckily for me, though, she gave me a pretty standard antibiotic prescription, which I took for five days and I was still sick. But after that, you know, it, it did it did leave my system very slowly. But it, it was my most depressing Christmas ever because I saw no one. I saw no family at all. I usually go over my sister's house um, and I was just laying in bed sick and I didn't get out of bed for about a week after that, which I spoke about in, a, in another video. Um, how did I get there? Well, I'm a bit off the track. I was talking about this girl at work. Okay, so I'm out on the road today, um, and I'm in the town that I live in, but it's a pretty big town, and I don't know much of the town. I've lived here now three years, but because of finances, even when I had my old job, you know, my mortgage was fairly crippling, and um, I couldn't go out and socialize, and I couldn't go out, you know, and eat, you know, in restaurants. And so I really didn't really discover my new town. You know, I figured I would save that for a time when finances were better. Um, and so I haven't done a lot of driving around my town, which turns out to be a huge, much, it turns out to be probably eight or nine times the size that I thought it was. Um, and it goes up into the woods and the sticks and areas that I didn't even imagine existed, you know, that were still part of my local area. Um, but I'm out, I'm out on the road, and I'm getting out of the truck and going to houses. Um, and this girl that I was talking about that I worked with, um, suddenly well, a car pulls in front of where my truck van was kind of parked on the side of the road. Um, and this car pulls in front of me, which I didn't think anything of because people always, you know, getting out of the car and doing things or, you know, they're parking in front of a house and they go into the house and over walks this girl that I've worked with all those years ago, you know, and she was one of the few that still works for the company. She is one of the few that didn't lose their job in the huge, huge downsizing of my department and the affiliated departments as well. Most of the people that do her job actually lost their job. Somehow she managed to keep hers. And there she is standing in front of me, and she sees what I'm doing for a living, and she kind of starts laughing. Not, you know, not in a mean way, but, you know, by the same token, she's one of the few people that I wouldn't, you know, from my old life there, that I, I wouldn't really want her to know what I'm doing now, you know, if I ran across her. I would have told her after the fact, let's say I leave this job and I get another job. And I said, hey, you know what I did for X number of months, you know, when I was between jobs, I did blah, blah, blah. And she's, you know, and the chance of her seeing me is so slim, you have no idea. First of all, I know the town where she lives. The town where she lives is right next to the old town that I moved out of. It's 20 or more miles away. There's literally no reason for her to have been in this area where I was out on the road. There's nothing there in particular uh, unique. All of the shopping malls, and there's multiple shopping malls in this area, are about a dozen miles away, actually in the same town that my old corporate job was in. 
Um, that's filled with huge shopping malls, but that's another dozen miles away from where she saw me out on this road in this kind of older, not great section of, of town. Not, not bad, just, just older, you know, older buildings, older houses. Um, I can't imagine why she was there unless she's got a friend that lives there and she was visiting on a, on a Saturday morning. But the fact is, is it's not like I was standing out in the middle of the street. She was driving by in her car and just happened to see me as I was walking down, I guess, from a house that I was do, doing my thing at. Um, and I was coming down, I guess, and going back to my van truck thing. Um, and she said, oh, that looks like Gary. And she pulled the car off to the side and waited until I got out of my truck again and walked over to me. Um, and, you know, I was kind of embarrassed, <laughs> to be honest. And uh, we're, we're such under scrutiny. I basically said to her, you know, I'll contact you later, whatever. I, I can't talk. You know, I'm under the gun. I have work to do. I'm being watched. You know, I'm being timed, which is all true. Um you know, um, it's all true because I don't even get to take, you know, we're supposed to take lunch. They deduct time that we're out in the road for lunch, uh, but I never take it. I can't because they're bitching about the amount of time it takes me to do my job. So every week I'm getting time deducted that I'm actually working for free. Um, but I have to do it in order to keep my job. Um, so that already sucks, you know. Um, but now the thing is, is too, I worked with her husband and her husband knows me. So she's clearly going to go home today and say to her husband, you never guess who I saw and what he was doing for work, you know? Um, but not only that, because she's one, of, she, I, actually, she's the only person that I started with at the company 28 years ago that is still there. The only one. One of the few that I wouldn't want her to know what I'm doing to earn a living now that still works for the company. So she's going to go back to the company and talk to my old boss, I guess, and whoever. And, and you know, by 10 o'clock Monday morning, everybody that remains in my old office who knows me, and it's not people that go back 30 years, but it's people that I've worked with in the last seven years that I was there, going to say, you never guess what happened. I saw Gary at you know, on, on Saturday, and guess what he was doing to earn a living, you know what I mean? By 10 o'clock in the morning, everybody in that fucking office is going to know, you know, what I'm doing, and this is not, you know, one of the few people I don't want, I don't want to know, and not, not that she's a blabbermouth, it's, I guess, human nature, and she's going to talk, and she's going to tell my old boss, and, you know, it, it's, you know, and I know she's already gone home, obviously, it's, it's late at night here now, um, and because I don't have to work tomorrow, I actually have a Sunday off. Um, you know, I've, her husband obviously already knows. Um, I don't know if he's gone on Facebook and tried to send me a message or not, but I've been going through these tonight, you know, and quite a few of these because that's a beer. But this is a twisted tea, which I had earlier. Forgive me. I had such a bad week last week, Saturday, when I got chewed out at work for coming back late, bringing back work that I couldn't finish, I mean, chewed out, um, that as soon as I got out of the office, which was like 6.30 or quarter to 7 on a Saturday night, and I had to work Sunday, that I... Um, Went to the local liquor store because I was out of beer and wine and any, any alcoholic beverages. And I blew like $45 on booze. And I'm not somebody that throws away money like that. You know, I'd rather spend $45 on CDs that I could potentially have for the rest of my life. Um, but I, I was just so flustered that money didn't matter, you know, and it ridiculous to spend 45 bucks on booze in my, in my opinion, you know, that, well, at least I didn't go to a bar and do it all in one night. I've got, you know, a 24 case of beer and stuff like that, you know, that's going to last me a while. But still, it's kind of um, a necessary throwing away of money when I think of the CDs. I could have got for $45 or music or something. I don't know. But I needed to get 
I needed to get tanked, you know. Um, and uh, and I didn't really get loaded, loaded. Plus, I had to work the next day. And here's the <laughs> here's another little odd coincidence. Um, most people that I work with, and most people in general, I think, don't like having to work on Sundays or Saturdays, for that matter. I think most of us would like to have a nice Monday through Friday job and Friday night, boom, the weekend starts. In this job, however, my that supervisor, that main one that yells and screams and runs the whole ship there, Monday through Saturday, is so disliked, not just by me, but by other people, that a lot of the people that are new hires that started with me are volunteering to work on Sundays because on Sundays we go to that different, um, you know, warehouse office, the one next to my old job. And there's a different manager there. Uh, the manager there is the manager of that physical specific office. And by having to work on Sunday, uh, you will then get a day off during the week. So most of the time they give you a five-day work week. Sometimes it's six, sometimes it could even be seven, but most of the time for their budgetary reasons, not because they like us and they want to give us two days off, um, you're always working on a Saturday, so you'll generally have one weekday off. If you work on Sunday, you'll have two weekdays off. So many of the people that I work with are willing to give up their Sundays, which means their entire weekends because they're already working Saturday, simply because by working on Sunday, they go to the office, the other main office, one less day during the week or during Monday through Saturday and have to deal with this manager one less day. And I definitely am one of those people. As much as I hate working on Sundays, and if I have to work on Saturdays, at least I get home Saturday evening and I feel that I have the semblance of a weekend by having Sunday off. Um, but by the same token, that means that during the next six days, Monday through Saturday, I'm going to be working five days, you know, in that, in that office um, with that manager there. On very rare occasions, and I don't know why this is, that particular nasty manager, the one in my town, and I don't know why she does this, on a very rare Sunday, she actually goes to this alternate office and works there. I don't know why, because typically the managers in that alternate Sunday office are the people who work there the rest of the week. I don't know why she goes there sometimes. So this week... I was actually hitting up the people that are working this Sunday to say, do you want me to work for you? Do you want me to work for you? Because I've had so many things with her in this past week and she's yelled and she screamed and she's written me up that I just want to get that extra, that one extra, you know, weekday or that one extra day between Monday through Saturday off where I know I don't have to see her. So between Monday and Saturday, I would have two days off where I didn't have to deal with her. I couldn't get anybody nobody to take that, you know, to, to allow me to work their Sunday. That's how much these people don't want to see her. You know, they figure, crap, no, you know, and I hit up to, and I know these people don't actually like working on Sundays, but they're doing it for the same reason that I'm doing it. And they're like, I'll work Sunday, you know, only because they just want to be away from her. Oddly enough, I found out last minute as I was leaving work on Saturday night, that this that tomorrow Sunday is one of the rare Sundays that this nasty manager is going to be working at that alternate facility. Um, weird. I don't know why she goes she goes there too. She's the manager in the facility in my town. The manager on Sunday in that alternate facility are usually the ones, are almost always the ones that work there during the week as well. So I wouldn't say I was saved, but y you know. Uh, I don't know. You know, right now, it's like, you know, in my mind, um, I had such a rough day when it was Friday that I was pretty sure I was going to quit when I got back to the office. 
And I think the only reason I didn't was because I'm in the middle of, of getting a couple dental things done or something, something minor, but I need coverage for this. And, um, I'm like, stick it out another two weeks. But, you know, my mind can't even fathom two fucking weeks doing this job. I have to take it two more weeks, I mean. You know, um, I have to take it day by day. And like I said, if, if it wasn't for the healthcare thing, I would have been gone, you know. Um, so that's that's what's going on. I have no, almost no musical stuff here. Um, but to talk about this, how horrible things are, there's no real reason. I just want to... I want to get this off my chest, so I'm talking to, I'm just talking to get it off my chest. And people, you don't have to watch it, you don't have to comment, it's okay, I'm, I'm putting it out there. Um, but I find myself, obviously, reflecting a lot on, on better times, you know, and um, I have a couple tricks, uh, they're not tricks, I have things that I do when I'm going through particularly rough times. And um, not that they, I don't think they, I wouldn't say they help, but I, 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 I fall into this thing where, I, where I, I do a couple things, and this is the only musical part that, that really comes into this, and, and that is when I'm going through really, really rough times in the past, and, and this has been since the early 80s, I want to say, I've talked about this, there's a section in Art Pepper's Straight Life Autobiography, now he's dead now, but... Um, where he had some rough times and he was in prison and everything else. There's a section in the book where um, he, he's out of prison, but he's not back yet working uh, as a musician because he's not sure if he wants to get back into that whole lifestyle because drugs go along with it and drugs is, leads to crime and crime is what leads him back into prison. There's this one section where he um, is working... He's, he's got a, he's got a friend, um, that he kept in touch with. And when he came out of, out of, um, out of prison and, and out of this, I don't know what you call this, 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 uh, almost, almost like a halfway house. It, it's, it's synonym is hard to explain, you know, what this voluntary, uh, lifestyle was in this, in this place that he was living in. But, um, Art, our great Art Pepper, is actually living with a friend um, who, who's a baker who owns a bakery and lives next door to it and, and hired Art as a general bookkeeper and a guy to, 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 to help run the business. So Art's doing the books and he's uh, ordering supplies for the bakers at this bakery and all that. And it's not a real glamorous job. It's a real, you know, working class job. But it's, it's for me... For most people reading the book, it'd be the most boring part of the book because Art's not in prison dealing with prison stuff, and he's not playing music, and he's not dealing with other musicians. For me, it's the one part of the book that I always go to. I don't know why. Um, and I would read it, and it would, you know, during difficult times in my life, and I would read it, and I would always um, kind of be amazed by it because Art Pepper was fairly famous, certainly in jazz circles, very famous. Um, at the time that he, you know, prior to his working at this bakery thing, and that's a real kind of working class job, and he's really working a lot of hours in the morning into the night, and he's doing the, the bookkeeping for these for this bakery, and he's um, doing people's paychecks and stuff like that, uh, hired by his friend, and um, it's certainly not glamorous. And reading that after, you know, having quite a bit of fame in, in his life um, always made me feel better, you know. And so, you know, it's a book that I was, it's my favorite book anyway of all time, but it's a book that I would pull out and read during times like this that are going on in my life. Now, recently, I found another book, very recently. I have to thank Carm for this. Um... Because Karn, a few months ago, sent me this. This is what I don't know that you hear any of this in the background. Steve Joliffe, who was a member of Tangerine Dream, um, he plays saxophone and flute. He's also a keyboard player. He played on, on one Tangerine Dream album called Cyclone in 1978, which I really don't like the album. Um, Steve sings on it, and he sings in kind of like a new wave 
punk voice. Most fans hate the album, deservedly so. It's it's awful. And um, they they changed direction right after that album and kind of went back to their all instrumental thing. Um, and as a result, I've now the thing is is I love the sax and flute playing on the album, which was done by Steve. I don't think he played any keyboards on the album, but he did play some really nice sax and flute. But as a result of the singing thing, I never picked up any of Steve's solo releases. Most of the ex-members of Tangerine Dream, I have solo albums by Peter Bauman, Chris Frank, even Jerome Fressa that um, Carm sent me. Um, Paul Hasslinger, I have solo stuff by. Um, who else? Uh, others. Ed Edgar himself, Edgar Fressa himself. And just, you know, but I never jumped into the Steve Joliffe bandwagon because... I don't know, because I was thinking maybe those vocals would pop up on his albums. And I must, I think I mentioned that to Carm. So Carm sends me this CD, which is really good. It's an album from the early 80s, I want to say. Uh, late 70s, early 80s? Well, uh, probably early 80s. It's got a 1982 copyright date on it, which doesn't mean much. But I, I think it's from the early 80s. Um, and uh, oddly enough, Tony Duhigg, or Duhigg, from Jade Warrior, plays on it. Now, that's another strange coincidence, because also I had just gotten into um, Jade Warrior's At Peace album, which is just a fantastic album, with just the two primary members of Jade Warrior on it, Tony Duhigg and John Field, the flute player. And I, and I had an earlier album by Jay Warrior, which I didn't even load into my computer where I listened to all my music from because I wasn't crazy about it. Um, not, not that it was bad. It just wasn't my thing. It sounded kind of like dated instrumental progressive rock. Um, and oddly enough, I, um, the CD's changing. So I know I've been talking a long time. Uh, is it going to change? I have this funny thing with my CD changer. When it switches from disc one to disc two, for some reason, the drawer opens instead of playing disc two. But it is playing disc two. Um, so talk about Steve Jolo. So I never did pick up any of the solo stuff. And Carm sent me this CD. And uh, strangely enough, just as I was getting into that one particular Jade Warrior album with Tony Duhigg on it, he sends me this CD, which has Tony Duhigg as one of only two, two other musicians who even play on it. So that was quite an odd coincidence in itself. And this is a fantastic album. I really like it. And Steve Joliffe, indeed, does not sing on it. Um, he plays synthesizers, piano, saxophone, and flute. And his flute playing and saxophone playing, I absolutely adore. I love it. Um, he does some sp spoken word stuff on it, but not singing. I didn't know until I got this that he was also a keyboard player. Um, because I don't think he's not credited with playing keyboards on the Tangerine Dream Cyclone album. As it turns out, you know, from what I've heard of him, he's a better keyboard player than Edgar Fressa himself. He's, and then caused me, just having that, been, being sent that one album from Carm, made me um, go on the internet and look up Steve Joliffe's website. And um, I uh, looked up his website where he's got a, a, a bit of his biography on there that he wrote himself. Um, and it was more than interesting. Um, and, um, you know, after hearing this, I'm like, well, you know what? Here's another guy I'm going to have to pick up more work by. It's a fantastic guy. I've been listening to this album since I got it. I don't remember when Carm sent it a couple, two, three, two, no, more than a couple months ago. It's on my nightly playlist and has been on since I got it. It's weird with the VCLT because every night I have a playlist of like a dozen albums, a dozen albums that I, that I play, that I put in my Windows Media Player, and they just play and play all night even when I'm sleeping. Um, I always, oddly enough, end up having something from that was sent to me in there from VCLT. Maybe it's a classical symphonic album, but Steve Joliffe has been in there since I got it. Excuse me, folks. Now, if I had to work tomorrow, right now I'd probably still be awake, but probably trying to go to sleep or thinking about trying to go to sleep. Um, so, the Steve Joliffe album was a lot better than anything I ever anticipated being from him. 
based on that Cyclone album, which is not representative of his music that he does. And I went on his website just to, you know, to see how many solo albums he's got out, see how much information there is about him. And there's this, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's long, but it's more than an excerpt of, uh, an autobiography that he wrote. Well, of course he wrote, it's an autobiography. <laughs> he wrote it. Um, but immediately upon reading it, I was like, wow, I really dig this guy. He's very upfront and honest um, about um, battles with depression. And he's, I don't know, I don't know if I would call it a, an artistic temperament that he has. He's an extremely sensitive person. And, um, and I think that is probably the thing that drives him. Um, and he just so happens to be an artist, or maybe that's the thing that got him into the appreciation of arts in general. He's a painter. He's a musician. I think he started as a painter more than a musician. Um, and, uh, you know, he writes poetry and, you know, he makes solo albums where he plays all the instruments, fantastic keyboard player. I love his flute and sax playing. What, what can I say? Synthesizer playing, whatever. Um, but he's incredibly honest in a way that, um, you don't see most people, uh, if they feel like that, it seems that a lot of his life has been, his life decisions have been based on um, not being um, happy with what's going on in life, feeling lonely, and so he makes a change in his life or something like that. And it's very unusual for people to be that open and honest about it. And that struck me, and that was just from the biography that was written on his website. And knowing he's uh, not a huge artist in terms of sales and the number of people that know him, I ended up sending, shooting an email to him, never expending, expecting to hear anything back, but just saying, wow, that I really appreciated that he put up that biographical information on there. I ended up hearing back from him personally a day or two late, not, e not even, within a day probably. And he said, oh, did you read the biography on my website or the book? Well, I was totally unaware that he self-published his own uh, autobiography. And he has on his website, like most artists do, a shop. And you could order most of his CDs from there. One of the, and, and he's even got a couple DVDs that are more art painting oriented. And he's got clips of him playing. It's a wonderful website. SteveJoliffe.net, I'm pretty sure it is. Um, and I just found it just by doing a Google search on Steve Joliffe, so it's it's easy to find. Um, well, as it turns out, he published this uh, this excerpt in his biography uh, that's on his website. Uh, doesn't actually say this is an excerpt from my biography, so I thought it was a fairly complete, you know, brief overview of his life. Um, and didn't realize that it was actually chunks taken out of his self-published book. I don't have a lot of money to, th to throw away to spend, but I got to tell you, I couldn't stop thinking about reading based on the way that he was writing. Um, yeah, music might be getting too loud now. The way that the way that he wrote and was so honest about his, his life um, on the website realizing that's just that he's expanded on that much more in his autobiography um even though it's coming from yeah, england i'm pretty sure i couldn't stop thinking about it so for like two weeks i was just like god damn i i, I want to read that and i'm doing the exchange rate because you're paying in pounds or whatever and it comes out to be like 37 38 dollars which is that's kind of a lot of money um and it's only 100 pages but I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I repeatedly went and kept on rereading the biography excerpt part of it that's up on the website. And, you know, I bit the bullet and I'm like, you know what? I know this is crazy, but I'm going to I'm going to buy it, you know. So with the exchange rate, it came to thirty seven or thirty eight dollars. 
And I know it's only 100 pages, but I have to tell you, for me, for me, this is worth it. I'm going to show it here, and I'm going to thank Carm for introducing me to Steve. Um, it's real simple. Steve apparently prints these up himself. He's got this little plastic spine that just you know, is one of the things you buy at the, you know, at the, you know, at the store, you know, where you buy paper and office supplies or whatever that holds it together. It's just a clip-on thing, and it's it, it, it it's true. It's only a hundred pages, and but I tell you, um, I don't mind spending thirty-eight dollars for it because um, I'm thinking and hoping and fairly sure that all of this is going directly into Steve's pocket. And Steve is quite honest about um, the fact that his albums only sell a handful of copies. And he says that several times over. He describes it as, you know, I have a handful of people who listen to my music, who buy my stuff. Um, he's not getting rich off it. And whatever Edgar Fressa from Tangerine Dream sold, you know, even in his less popular years, um, I don't think Steve comes anywhere near that. So for that sake, and I'm, and I'm fairly sure that this got directly into Steve's hands, um, I don't mind, you know, paying it. There's, there's typos in here and stuff. Um, but I'll tell you, it, 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 it's nice because, you know, he actually, there's, there's photographs in there of his house. You know, he talks a lot about me. It's re he's really honest about his whole life. Um, so there's photographs interspersed throughout and having read the, um, biography online, I knew exactly the type of writing it would be. And I have to tell you, um, man, I feel like this guy's like a kindred spirit. Honestly, the, the thing that drives him through life to change and to be dissatisfied with his life, um, he's very honest with. He describes himself um, in the book several times as a failure, which, you know, is completely wrong. I mean, artistically, I, you know, from what little I see on, on, on his website, from his paintings, I love them. No doubt about his music is, is there's nothing wrong with his music, you know. And, and the fact is, if his music was completely the way it was, unchanged, but sold a million copies, people would call him successful. Um, and simply because the world, the entire world out there doesn't know who he is and doesn't buy his albums by the hundreds of thousands, he equates to being a failure. Um, so he's, you know, he's he's fairly down on himself. Um, and I, after I got the book, I, um, well, in with the book, he included a free CD. This is one of his albums. This is the one that's playing in the background now because the one that Carm gave me is already finished playing. Um, he said it just came in this, you know, plastic envelope, but he sent it in with the book. So, you know, it really kind of increased the value of it. Um, he signed it. And I can tell he signed it because you probably can't see that he closed the booklet while the ink was still a bit wet. So there's a few dots that you can't see that, that, that come on the book from closing it while the ink is still wet and it gets a little dotted. But, you know, I mean, his signature is very clear. So he signed that as well as signing the book. Um, and, you know, never stated that, you know, order this book and get a free CD or anything like that. He just threw it in there. So I sent him an email thanking him for including the CD and signing it. And he got back to me again and said, keep in touch, you know. Um, uh, and, Knowing the kind of writing that was on there, I very much wanted to take it slow. And I only wanted to read a few pages at a time and read them slowly because um, it's only 100 pages. And I really wanted to savor it and just go through it and absorb it and appreciate it. Uh, because here's a guy who seems to go through life feeling much the way that I do. Um and um, I tell you, though, I, I could the, uh, I was kind of successful with reading maybe eight or ten pages here and there. But then I had, one, I had one night when things were just going so bad at work and everything. And I felt so bad that I just dove into the book and it was like, I'm just going to do ten pages here. And I ended up reading like 60 more pages, you know, practically to the end. Um, and I couldn't hold myself back. I couldn't control myself. So is it worth 38 bucks? Yeah, because this is now, 
I'm sorry, Art Pepper, but you know, I think this is going to be my go-to book when I'm feeling crappy about my life and I want to feel like somebody else has been there and kind of experiences things and, and, and seems to perceive and feel um, much about things the way I do. He's a, a vegetarian as well, you know, which I've been for a lot of years for the same reasons I am. Fairly sensitive guy. And um, plus, you know, he's got the one thing he's got over art is he's still alive and he's still very much around. Um, man, is this a, you know, and like there's there's some there's some like typos and things in here. So um, I could tell, you know, I, there's Tangerine Dream when he was in it, by the way. It's nice because there's some nice photos interspersed with it. And um I'm trying. I'm trying to keep it, uh, you know, as uh, I'm keeping it inside a Manila envelope here. Like I'm just trying to um, preserve it as much as possible because this is my this is my go-to book when I'm feeling shitty and depressed about my life now. Um, so that's it. Besides Cyclone, I don't have a, a lot of Steve Joliffe CDs. I have the one Carm sent me. I have the one Steve Joliffe sent me. Oddly enough, I had another one that I. I wouldn't say forgot about, but um, if you're aware of Klaus Schultz made a bunch of albums under the uh, group fake name Richard Wanfried, um, and I had this album, and I've I've got several of the Richard Wanfried albums which I don't really like most of. They they were done at a time that I didn't like Klaus Schultz's solo music so much from this period. It was about the eighties, I guess. Um, now the saxophone is getting kind of loud. Hold on. Uh, sorry, Steve. Um, and um, so, you know, I, I I haven't listened to Richard Wanford music much. Um, they're like they're uh, most of the albums are like poor, very bad Klaus Schultz albums, to be honest with you. Um, and they're collaborative albums with other artists. So I had this one, and I'm reading that Steve, you know, Joliffe had gone back and played on one of these albums. And I'm like, well, yeah, I, yeah, I have that one. Turns out I had never opened it. It was still sealed. Um, it's more like something I picked up when I got it cheaply, and I never even listened to it because the other Richard Wanfried albums are so horrible. So I actually opened this, and this was just within the last uh, week. And oddly enough, this is the best Richard Wanfried album that there is out there, no doubt about it. It's like a fairly decent Klaus Schultz album from the era. No singers, thankfully. Um, and only two long tracks. There's uh, one track, which is a 25-minute track, and one which is a 29-minute track, which is similar to Klaus Schultz's early solo albums in terms of the length. You know, there's two really long pieces on there. Steve Joliffe plays flute on it on one track, on the first track, the 25-minute track, and it's really good. Um, and I had never I had never even opened it. Um, and so this was a nice, pleasant surprise. So it's it's like, you know... Something I had, I've had, I've had that for over ten years, and I never opened it. Um, it was more like a, I got it cheaply, kind of. A, I, I was kind of a Klaus Schultz completist. This is before he started reissuing hundreds of things that it's impossible to get everything now. Um, and I'm pleasantly surprised. It's like a fairly decent early '80s Klaus Schultz album with Steve Jolis' wonderful flute playing on it, which really makes it. Too bad he doesn't play on the whole album, on both tracks. Um, so I have, to, I have to thank Carm for that because, you know, with my financial situation, with all the great albums out there that, you know, artists that I haven't sampled, I may have never gotten around to Steve Joliffe. And it's not just his music that I appreciate, but, you know, I've got that, that autobiography now and it's like, wow, holy crap, I'm blown away by it. So, I mean, I'm definitely going to be rereading that. Um, many times. It's never going to leave my side. And if I have to buy another copy because something happens to this one, I, I will, even if it's still $38. You know, it's the unfortunate exchange rate now. I guess with the pound? Euro, I don't know if I paid pounds or euros, but it was 25 whatever. 25 euros or 25 pounds, uh, which equated to about $38 US dollars. Um, so now I have a book to comfort me during my difficult times. Um, you know, why did I do this video? I don't know why I did this video. <laughs> you can expect more of them, but I won't totally blow off the music thing. Um, 
but I did I did want to talk anyway about this Steve Joliffe uh, autobiography. But but you know I did want to mention specifically why it it moves me and it touches me and I like it so much, and um, it kind of dovetails right into my current situation. So I definitely would have been explaining how horrible things have been going, um, and so you know it's a nice thing to have. It's one of those things that, uh, you know, it's going to be a go-to thing for me. Um, so again, I have to thank Harm for, you know, getting me there because, um, you know, without having sent the one album that I really like, that's really good by him, I wouldn't have discovered him. I wouldn't have discovered the book and I wouldn't have discovered the kind of, the kind of person Steve is because there's a lot of times when an artist that you love is a horrible person, you know, and you try to, Put that out of your mind, maybe when you're listening to their music, um, you know. But it's 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 always there. You don't forget that. Um, and Steve is the complete opposite. So, guys, almost an hour. What can I say? Uh, I don't know what to call this. This is more of a diary than anything else. Well, I hope things are going uh, decently for for everyone. You know, everybody out there. It seems like a busy time. Most people have got a lot of work going on, um, more so than, than, than I think a, a few months ago. But I hope everybody gets a chance to, you know, get some free time to themselves and relax and listen to music and buy tunes and whatever. And I'll be back with a, you know, a musical thing eventually, you know, um, probably during my next day off, which I, I don't know when that is. And, um, thanks, Carm. Thanks for getting me there, buddy, because, uh, you know, this, 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 that autobiography is a big deal to me. It really is. Um, so guys, I'm going to sign off because it's been too long. And, um, thanks for watching. If you have, I'll be back with normal stuff, hopefully normal stuff soon. Take care.